Good morning. I'm Sarah Coakley. I'm a theologian and an assisting priest at the Church of the Ascension and St. Agnes in Washington, DC. And I welcome you this morning to the first in a series of webinars from our School of Theology and Prayer. If you are already members of the congregation, then it's delightful to see you again in this form. If you are visiting um, through this webinar series, then I sincerely hope that you'll come and visit us in person one day when this terrible plague is over. And I send special greetings to you from our rector, Father Dominique Peribin, from our vestry and wardens, and sincerely encourage you to become more acquainted with our parish if you are visiting downtown DC. So this morning, I am taking you on a tour of discussion of the core subject of our faith, that of resurrection. But before we start, I want to make sure that all of you know how to work the webinar so that you can ask questions as we go along. And indeed, there will be three moments during this hour when I pause to ask my assistant, uh, Amanda Bourne, who is behind the scenes, I think she's going to make herself appear, um, who is a recent graduate of Virginia Seminary and a, a technological wizard who is helping me here. Um, and if a question occurs to you while I'm speaking, um, you simply activate the toolbar at the bottom of this screen. You may need to use your um, uh, mouse to wake that up. And there you will see um, a, an icon that says Q and A. And if you do a simple right click on that, a white box will open up, which you can move to the right out of the way while you type into it. Um, and then the important thing is to remember to um, press return when you want to send your question. And that will then land in the technological lap of Amanda. And she will be sorting out the questions. And at the end of each of the sections of discussion, she will feed me back some of those questions. Unfortunately, since there are rather a lot of you, it's really wonderful that we've had a full slate of people sign up for these um, theological talks. We're up to over 100. Um, obviously, I can't answer 100 questions, but I will answer at least two or three pressing and tricky ones that, um, that Amanda will, will sort out for me. Let's turn then today to this question that is core to our faith, and without which, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, um, our faith is in vain. If we cannot believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then the whole edifice collapses. But as is perhaps particularly true in the Episcopal Church, there is a great deal of squeamishness about how to um, express this belief in the modern world with the incursions of historical criticism on the Bible and the incursions of modern science on our belief in this area. So I'm going to take you through three uh, sets of reflections uh, on this problem. And to put my cards on the table, at the, in the last section, I'm going to give you an approach to this, which is really particularly my own and is particularly connected with the activity of prayer. And I, I hope to at least tease you in this area to think about this in a slightly new way as a result. But let's start by an, uh, an introduction um, in which we simply get clearer about what we are talking about when we talk about resurrection, because there are a number of evocations of, re of re resurrection, and we need to know which particular one we're focusing on today. If you have printed out your handout, you'll have these points already before you. That handout should have come to you with your email. Um, but don't worry if you haven't done that. I think you'll be able to follow along anyway. Let's make a distinction then first in this introduction semantically between these four different evocations of the resurrection. First, it's extremely important for all moderns, and this is often forgotten, to reflect first on what resurrection meant at the time of Jesus. Um, if we try and jump into this question as a kind of extrinsic miracle without seeing the hermeneutical context in which this claim was made by the earliest disciples, then um, we may be barking up the wrong tree. So in Jesus' time, it was a contested 
in so Jewish topic about whether there would be a bodily resurrection for all, and if so, when. The presumption was that it would be at the end of time. And we see a debate in the New Testament already going on in Jesus' time in Mark 12, 18 to 27 and parallels, where Jesus is tested by the Sadducees about whether he believed in the resurrection with that story about how many wives you would have if you still had a body at that time. So we need to be aware first that there is this dispute about um, uh, uh, what's going on at this time and uh, that the disciples themselves had to come to terms with that when they uh, proclaimed Jesus' resurrection because the idea that one person should be raised before the end of the general resurrection was the novum here. Secondly, and this is what most moderns are concerned about, there's the issue of the debate about the resurrection as to what happened to Jesus' body individually post-mortem after death. And this is probably the most difficult issue for moderns, and it concerns how we assess the stories about the empty tomb. And I'm going to give most of my time to that today in the first section of this talk. Thirdly, however, often people talk about the resurrection, and uh, there's an aspect of the New Testament that is concerned with this way of talking about it as an existential or faith-based response to Jesus' life and witness, which is based in religious and spiritual experience now. In other words, as um, a contemporary um, flavor for the entirety of our faith. Um, the question is whether that works unless you have a conviction about what happened to Jesus' body first. And fourthly, there is, of course, the major concern that we all have, not least in the middle of a pandemic, about what happens to us individually after our own individual deaths. And then here, resurrection becomes a question about life after death in general, whether there's a separation between soul and body, if so, where the soul is in this period between now and the end of time, when, according to Paul, we shall all get our special resurrection bodies back. I'm not going to focus on this last question today, but I think that needs a whole session on its own because it raises such enormous philosophical issues. But I'm pointing out now that whatever you decide about the other questions is going to have enormous implications for that last one. So without further ado, let's push now into section one. How can I believe in the resurrection? And let's think of these three different approaches to this issue. And I'm going to start with what I call the detective story about Jesus' post-mortem body. What happened to his body in the tomb when it supposedly rose again in some other form? And what we, I think, inevitably want to ask as moderns here is, what can we establish here as demanded or at least verified or at least made somewhat probable by the evidences as we have them? The evidence specifically about the empty tomb, because if the tomb wasn't empty, then um, the bones are still there somewhere, and this faith is in vain, it seems. But also about the appearances and what kind of veridicality they have. Now, the first thing that happens here is that when one begins to look at the actual evidences in the New Testament, one sees that they are a complete jumble of different records. And you can either see this as a huge problem, or you can see it as a sign of authenticity. You would think that if the disciples had made up this story, they would have got together and made it more convincing and consistent. But I just want to remind you how inconsistent these stories are, just very briefly. And if you have your Bible then, you can flip between uh, Mark 16, Matthew 28, Luke 24, John 20 and 21. But then most importantly, and perhaps this is where we should start, you should be looking at Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, because this is actually the earliest written text that we have. In uh, It's earlier than any of the gospel writings, in which Paul very clearly wants to insist that the appearance that Jesus made to him on the Damascus Road was, albeit to one untimely born, as he puts it, but nonetheless, an authentic manifestation of the risen Christ, 
as he seems to be saying, of the same genre as the previous ones. Um, by the way, the Damascus Road story, the first one comes in Acts 9, is repeated in Acts 22 and 26, not with quite the same details. So again, there we have a slight trickiness about how to um, adjudicate exactly what happened to Paul. But clearly for Paul, it was deeply important that Jesus had been raised. But at the same time, he only mentions glancingly that Jesus was buried at Afe. He doesn't go into any detail at all about the empty tomb. Um, and that in itself, as we'll see in a moment in the second section, is an issue. If we go to the gospel accounts, we find an extraordinary array of different fascinating stories about exactly what happened on that Easter Sunday morning. If we go first to, um, to Mark, which is the probably almost certainly the earliest gospel, we find there were two Marys who went to the tomb. They were met by a young man and who just told them they had to go somewhere else, that he's not here. And they fled in fear, Ephobuntagar, the gospel ends. They were afraid. So all it tells us really was that something staggering had happened. They didn't know what, and that uh, this filled them with awe. That's something, there's something very authentic there, I think, to end the gospel in that extraordinary way, even though two other endings were later added on. Then in Matthew 28, we get two Marys who are met by an angel, um, not a young man, but it could be the same thing. Then Jesus suddenly appears to them and they kiss his feet. So that's the first appearance here. Then we hear about Jesus's appearance in Galilee to all the disciples with his demand that they go and preach to all nations. That sounds a bit more like a kind of ascension story, but not called it as such in Matthew. In Luke, we get further developments and iterations and more stories, very fascinating. So in Luke 24, women go to the tomb, um, but Peter also arrives. And uh, both in John and Luke, we have Peter arriving on the scene. In John, we have John as well. This suggests um, a certain, I think, need of the early church that, um, that the, at least some of the male disciples were involved in the empty tomb story, whether they were originally or not. But quickly, we then switch to the wonderful Emmaus story where two followers of Jesus and not members of the 11 um, are met by a strange person whom they don't recognize, but then reveals himself and vanishes over the breaking of bread. And then we have another story in Luke where Jesus um, appears to the 11 and shows them his hands. And what's really important here is that he wants to tell them he's not a ghost and he asks for something to eat so that he can prove that he's, in some sense at least, still physiological. He's not just a spirit. And then we get what is classically called the ascension story at the end of Luke. And finally, in John, we have a very key position for Mary Magdalene alone, which is different, notice, from um, the other Mary stories um, in the other Gospels. She comes first to the tomb, finds the stone rolled away, but then Peter and John put on in their appearance and go into the tomb and witness to the fact that it's empty. And then we have the wonderful story of Mary meeting the gardener and she doesn't recognize him. And I'm going to come back to this at the end of this discussion. She has to turn twice before she sees who he is. And even then she's not allowed to catch and hold him. Then we have uh, an appearance to the, uh, the disciples without Thomas, where peace and the Holy Spirit are dispensed. Then we have the wonderful Thomas story, that great empiricist of the New Testament who really wants to put his hands in to the side Actually, interestingly, the text does not say that he does that. It's only as a little bit later in Ignatius of Antioch that the story develops in that way, that he had to put his hands in. In fact, in John, he just immediately sees that this is his Lord and his God. And then in chapter 21, we have the wonderful story of the miraculous catch of fish, where Peter jumps in the water and rushes to the shore. But again, it's not clear immediately that this is Jesus, although it says, they knew it was the Lord. Now that's a very brief resume 
of the extraordinary number of different accounts of what the appearances on the empty tomb meant for the Testament writers. And let's just reflect on briefly on when we think about them together, what this might mean. Um, first, we notice that the empty tomb accounts are at least notably distinct from a poet's accounts. So some of them have a great emphasis on the emptiness of the tomb and the need to go somewhere else. He's not here. Why seek the living amongst the dead? Others simply go straight into his miraculous appearance. Um, and the modern period has tended to drive a wedge between those two and sometimes to say that we could bracket the empty tomb problems and simply focus on the appearance notions. Again, as I've already noted, note the really extraordinary lack of obvious sort of concerted coordination of these events. If someone was tidying this up for a police court, they would have to do a better job. There's an authenticity isn't there about their untidied up, or is that a sign of mythological elaboration which should make us more suspicious of them? That's one of the major issues here for the empirical approach. Um, also, we do notice that there are certain apologetic aspects seep in in some of the later accounts, so that Luke should be terribly interested in saying that this isn't a ghost, for instance, suggests that um, there are questions about this, that there has been discussion about this, and that needs to be underscored. Um, the wonderful story about Thomas shows that there were people who were sceptical, who didn't believe in it to really. Um, and we see at the end of Matthew in 27 and 28 already uh, early embroidery suggesting that the Jewish authorities um, were already claiming that perhaps the body had been stolen and taken away from the disciples themselves. So, on earth do we weigh these evidences? One of the great problems, of course, here is that they all come from people who have an interest in asserting the resurrection. Um, and that in itself is a, an issue for testimony, not only in the period of, of Jude, early Judaism, but also in contemporary Greek studies. There are three people that I think of in the Israeli theological landscape in the West who have most firmly insisted that uh, these evidences are sufficient to give us a kind of empirical, if not certainty, then at least a great enough probability to mandate belief in the institute and the post-mortem transformation of Jesus' body into a different kind of resurrection body. The people who have insisted that there is enough evidence here to sway even a skeptic, now this is a hard bar, to, to sway even a skeptic, vary from someone like Wolfhard Pannenberg, who insists that if we can't give that kind of level of apologetic certainty out of these historical evidences, then the whole edifice of Christianity and particularly the claims for Christ collapses. But that to do that, we have to get right into the mindset of the um, earliest Christians and their Jewish background. In a similar way, N.T. Wright, who has written an enormous book on the resurrection, and there are lots of good um, web materials from him that you can easily watch, likewise insists that we must get into the mindset of Jesus's time that we must see that what he was doing was bringing to fruition Israel's expectations of a Messiah of the coming kingdom, and that the whole context of resurrection is that. We mustn't extrapolate from that into a kind of um, antiseptic modern law court um, detective story undertaking, although Wright thinks that if we do it that way, we will still ought to be convinced. Someone like Richard Swinburne, who's a philosopher of religion in the analytic tradition, wants to put it a little differently and to argue that these evidences will only produce, as in law court assessment and in um, philosophy of science, a level of probability. But as long as the probability that Jesus' body was transformed is slightly higher than half, 0.5, then um, that will do. That seems strange to many people because it sounds like when you get out of bed in the morning, you only need to just know 
that God exists and he has raised Jesus from the dead? Isn't there a stronger conviction that's needed for faith? So I think that we have a strange pincer movement in the modern period about the empty tomb detective story approach. On the one hand, there are those theologians, and they have been actually the dominant theologians of the late 20th century and early 20th century, who think that this whole approach through empirical evidences is the wrong approach, that it's not the one that faith should take, that um, if you are, for instance, a follower of Rudolf Bultmann, then it's pointed out by him that if you try and, as it were, get faith out of the empirical evidences, then you are making faith into a kind of works righteousness. You're trying to work it up out of secular sources rather than responding to the existential demands of faith. And likewise, Karl Barth, who saw the resurrection as the absolutely unique, miraculous intersection of the supernatural and the natural, um, objects that this is also to understand the nature of faith if we are, as it were, worrying about these empirical evidences as if it was up to us, as opposed to God's revelatory announcement, whether we can believe this or not. And there are other strands of philosophy of religion at the moment, represented by someone like Alvin Plantinga, that say that faith really isn't like this. It isn't, it isn't a matter of dredging up evidences until you're sufficiently persuaded that it would not be irrational to believe, but rather that there are certain things in faith that, as Plantinga puts it, are properly basic, just as in our ordinary perceptual life, learning how to see and re-identify re objects is, in a way, a circular undertaking. We, we find out about that by doing it. So within faith, we don't start every morning from a, um, a moment of cosmic skepticism, but we step into a circle of properly basic beliefs. The trouble with that, of course, as the great philosophers of the modern period, David Hume and John Locke would have said, is that that's awfully gullible, you might think. Wouldn't you want to know if you were trying to explain, especially to a skeptical or atheistical intera interactor, that this business about Jesus's body, which is basic to the faith, could be established, could be shown to be at least not in complete um, abrogation of scientific and historiographical thinking. And so it's almost like these two approaches to the resurrection in response to this problem, the Bartian or Bultmanian one on the one hand, which as it were, steps away from the detective investigation and the Lockean and Humean insistence that you can't do that if you're going to be a rational believer are like two sides, sides of a modern coin. And we are left therefore with, um, I think, great difficulties if we take the scientific and historiographical issues seriously, how we are to respond. Um, so let me just pause at this point and this, is, this has been the longest section of the discussion. And to say that I have some provisional conclusions here. And that is that it seems to me that the New Testament evidences are extraordinarily alluring, suggestive, convincing at the level of people who have experienced something they can't completely understand and comprehend. And that's not surprising because whatever it is, is completely unique but that the evidences do leave many unanswered questions. They leave unanswered questions simply at the level of bringing the evidences into some coordination, but also at the underlying level of how we confront a uh, demand of faith that seems to fly in the face of the rationalities of modern historiography on the one hand and of modern science on the other. So my view here is, after many years of struggling with this, is that if we just approach the resurrection through the category of a detective story about Jesus's body, we will be left with an extraordinarily exciting but frustrating question mark, an alluring invitation, as it were, to go somewhere else in order to complete our understanding of this phenomenon. Now I'm going to pause and I'm going to get a couple of questions.
You're there. <laughs> I am, yes. Um, so everyone, feel free to send in your questions via the Q&A at the bottom bar, um, or you can send them in via chat. I see, I see everything. Um, <laughs> so um, our first question um, is a bit of a feminist question. So it's the questioner asks, do you think there is something going on with the resurrection account uh, reflecting Jewish laws against the issue of women's testimony in court? That's a very fascinating question. Um, in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 19, there are some rules given about the conditions under which um, testimonies um, are acceptable um, according to Torah. And of course, there was a further gloss on that in earliest um, uh, early rabbinic reflections in the Mishnah and later in the Talmud. Um, it's not the case actually that women are completely debarred from being um, reliable witnesses. Um, I think the scholarly consensus on this has changed recently um, to some degree. Um, Deuteronomy itself doesn't rule out women, it just doesn't discuss them. Um, there certainly was a suspicion that they were not as reliable as men. And this may be hovering in the background of some of the um, vicissitudes between whether it's first and foremost the women and only secondly the men who arrive at the tomb. Um, but uh, there's a much later ramification of all this in the scholastic period when Thomas Aquinas in the third part of the summer, I think it's question 55, comes back to why it was women who got there first. And, he has this lovely reflection that kind of makes up for that suspicion that women's, as he puts it, greater capacity for love um, partly explains why they didn't run away in the crucifixion and also why they got there first um, early on the Sunday morning. Um, and that therefore it is the case in some important way that um, love has to be united with intellect in responding to the reality of the resurrection. Mm. Do you want another question? I can take one more, I think, very quickly. Mm. Uh, brilliant. So, so we have one more question that's come in. Um, what would you say to those more liberal leaning Christian writers that assert that the resurrection should be understood metaphorically? Yes, great. I'm coming to that, as we say. <laughs> that's the next section. Um, and uh, I'm going to say that there's many dimensions of that approach which are um, significant for the full range of reflections we need on the resurrection and which the, 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 the Gospels and, and the New Testament present us with. But there's a bit of a, um, there's a, there's a, bit of a, a large story that would have to be told about what metaphor means for me to answer this question without falling into a black hole. Um, because some people, when they say something is only a metaphor, they mean it's not really true, but I just want to think about it that way symbolically. In my view, I would say metaphors at base um, express something very difficult to express by doing it via the use of notions brought in from some other realm, as it were. Um, when I call, when I say that Cynthia is a hedgehog, um, I sort of cause a free song of surprise because you know Cynthia, you know she's a bit prickly, but by calling her a hedgehog, I'm creating a metaphor which we all instinctively understand, but it works because of this, as it were, constellation of two different forms um, or two different ideas taken from different categories. Metaphors, of course, can become dead and then they cease to surprise. So there's no simple answer to that rather trick question um, unless we have an understanding of what we mean by metaphor i don't think metaphor means myself non-real but some people think of it that way um, i'm going to go on to say that i think i'm dissatisfied with any account of the resurrection which doesn't ultimately confront the issue of jesus's body I wouldn't have said that when I was a young theologian, but I say it now, and by the end of this hour, I'll tell you why I've changed my mind. Thank you. Has the rustling problem of my papers gone away? Good. It has. <laughs> yeah. um, my apologies for that, if that was very distracting. Um, let me come now then to, much more briefly, to the latter two sections of this reflection. I want to come now to what would 
what that interlocutor might call the metaphoric approach or what I've here called the existential or sometimes subjective theory approach to the resurrection. And this can be expressed either in a skeptical form or in a positive spiritual form. It can be expressed as meaning that these original disciples were suffering from collective delusions or hallucinations, which can happen hysterically. We know that as a medical phenomenon in the modern period. Um, or it can be expressed, I think, very importantly, as the insight that belief in the resurrection to core is not just a belief in what happened to Jesus's dead body, in becoming alive again in a new form, but it involves a cosmic transformation of how we understand reality as a whole, as, say, Paul explains so beautifully in, in Romans 8, that the whole creation now is groaning into this reality that Jesus has expressed in being the first fruits of resurrection life. Um, now, there are disadvantages and advantages to making this your sole approach, even if you don't take the skeptical view about hallucinations. And to go back to where we began, the most obvious uh, disadvantage is what Paul quite clearly says in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, Verse 14, if there was no actual raising of Jesus's body, then our faith is in vain. Um, at best, it must become something that could be called a, as modern philosophers, Wittgenstein, John Hick call it, a seeing as, a choosing to see the world as shot through with the glory of um, anticipatory um, uh, resurrection life. Um, whilst remaining skeptical or agnostic about what happened to Jesus himself. Now, some people are very happy to live in that seeing as realm. And as I've already stated, in a way that's been baptized in a new way in the modern period by the kind of existential or revelatory um, positivistic insistence of a Bultmann or a Bart, who says, you know, don't seek the reality of resurrection in detective empirical investigations. That goes nowhere. Um, but there still is this problem. What do you say? What do you say to a, a skeptical friend um, on Easter Day? You mean you're just going through the motions? You just think it's a nice idea? Um, however rich your theory of metaphor, that does seem to be a huge problem. The other good side of this approach, however, is that side of it which really takes up what we already see in the New Testament as infusing the religious life of the earliest Christians. Paul's conversion, he was turned around. Whatever resurrection belief is, it must be about being turned around in some way, in seeing the world completely differently um, as a result of some kind of experiential response. And that is also philosophically quite strong, um, despite what skeptics say, because when we meet people who've had very powerful experiences and we know them to be reliable people on other grounds, it's perfectly appropriate, philosophers would now say, to regard their testimony as uh, uh, reliable, at least in base, um, it's called the principle of testimony because we know that they're not psychotic. They've not just drunk a whole bottle of whiskey. There are other um, uh, ways that we could rule out um, what they're saying as unconvincing. But if on other grounds, they are, not only, they are not only reliable people, but in some cases we have to admit truly saintly people and they believe what they say about the resurrection. This strikes us I think rightly, as further evidence for this kind of approach that is existentially based. I can think of some people in our own parish, one who has recently died, who was a witness to the power of the resurrection. And uh, we need to count this kind of evidence as well. The question is whether it can do all the work um, instead of the work that the empirical investigation about Jesus's body itself, um, so that we can set that up on one side. That's the issue that I think is bothersome. Should we take another question now before I go into my last denouement? 
So the um, so we did have a question that came in. Um, so there's a question about what role might divine revelation play in one's belief in the resurrection? Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Um, well, clearly, as already um, mentioned in relation to the um, crucially central view of revelation in the theology of Karl Barth, perhaps the most uh, significant theorizer about revelation in the 20th century, you, you, can't, you can't have, I think, a convincing belief in the resurrection while ducking the question of revelation. And that's one of the problems about the detective story approach. If you want the detective empirical investigation to do all the work, and even to do enough work, as David Hume required, for it to make it more miraculous not to believe than to believe, which is a high bar test, you are then putting yourself in a position where you've, as it were, bracketed revelatory force in order to try and work up the empirical evidences to a place where it becomes rational to believe this. And there's something odd about that, as I pointed out. So whatever resolution we have here has got to be a place where evidences, your theory of revolution, revelation, your theory of biblical authority, which we haven't talked about yet, but is obviously also crucial as part of your theory of revelation, and also existential and spiritual factors are all brought together. And I think any account of resurrection which doesn't put all those pieces on the table, that doesn't mean that any of them are uncontentious because there are different possible theories of revelation. Um, but anyone that doesn't put those pieces on the table is going to be lacking. The question is whether you can do without any of the pieces. Shall I carry on now into my third section? I've deliberately kept the second se section a little short. We may want to come back to it at the end, just because I think that the second section is where a lot of liberal Episcopalians are. And I probably don't need to explain that more. What is more puzzling, I think, is this third point. Um, and I don't expect you all to be convinced by this, but let me tell you that this third point reflects um, an important dimension of my own spiritual autobiography, which I will not go into at length. That would be narcissistic. But I do remember that as a very young theologian, I wrote a ferociously negative article against Wolfhard Pannenberg and his arguments for the resurrection which I read again this weekend and was thoroughly embarrassed by, but it, re it, it, it represented me in my, as it were, Lockean, Humean, modernistic, skeptical phase. I really wanted to get to the bottom of this detective story and I really wanted to see whether you could make this resurrection belief fly on those bases. And I thought that you could. And I think I was right to say that you couldn't. I think I was right to say that the best you can do out of that, but you do have to do it, is to get to this point of kind of awe and wonder and uncertainty and at least possible openness, but probably no further. So now I want to come to a third point here in my last section in which I suggest that the disjunction that kind of opens up in contemporary Christians' lives between the conservative and the liberal, roughly represented, as it were, um, by the conservative's willingness to go the whole hog on the empty tomb, and the liberal squeamishness about it, has something missing. And this actually does, of course, relate to that very good question about revelation. What is the thing that's missing? And I think the thing that's missing is how in true entry into the depths of resurrection faith, we are being drawn into a place where all our faculties and perceptions, um, our intellect, our feeling, our sensations are being integrated over time. Sometimes this happens very suddenly, but sometimes it happens quite slowly over a lifetime, which is certainly true of me. So I ask here in this third section, why don't we focus now on what is the proper, in technical terms, epistemological response to the resurrection evidences? That is not what do they look like dispassionately in, re in, re in relation to a, a past extrinsic body. But how is it that I myself must respond to them in the life of faith? And I like to bring in here the notion of spiritual sensation, which was an early church 
um, set of reflections developed originally by the, the philosopher and theologian Origen in the third century, and later by a whole host of others, including my particular favorite, Gregory of Nyssa, about how over a lifetime of prayer, our intellect, our moral sensibilities, and our sensational life are, as it were, honed towards perceiving Christ uh, through the practices of prayer, through the reception of the sacraments, through particularly acts of mercy to the poor and the destitute and the sick. And the reason I think this links to the resurrection stories particularly is that it relates to a number of really intriguing little details in those stories, which I didn't pause on when I looked at the evidences at the beginning of this session. But I hope they've made you wonder at times. Let me just reflect on them together. Um, there seems to have been some difficulty, even amongst close disciples of Jesus, about perceiving him in his resurrection appearances. Um, so that, for instance, right at the end of Matthew, and he need not have said this, in Matthew 28, 17, the last appearance, the kind of quasi-ascension appearance of Jesus in the end of Matthew, he says, but some doubt it. So it seems you could have been there, but not, was not really be sure that this, you were seeing Christ. That's interesting. It might be regarded as sort of a skeptical nail in the, co in, in the coffin. But then think rather differently of Mary Magdalene in John 20. Um, I mentioned this earlier. She doesn't recognize Jesus. She thinks he's the gardener. What's going on? Is it because he's deliberately hiding or is it because something has to happen to her before she can recognize him? Interestingly, she can't see him as Jesus, but when she hears his voice, she responds. And twice it says in John that she had to turn, that something had to happen as it were in her response. Likewise, the extraordinary story of the Emmaus Road, which is so wonderful, which clearly reflects, as it were, the first generation Christians already finding their response to Jesus in the act of the Eucharist, I think. But you could walk the whole way to Emmaus with someone and not know it was him. How do you do that? That's really interesting, isn't it? It must be telling us something about how one does or does not respond to the risen Christ. And I also love that last story in John 21 that was clearly added, I think, um, after John 20, put on the end of the gospel later, um, where Simon jumps into the water <laughs> and rushes to the shore, but even then they're not quite sure this person is Jesus. I don't think it was because they were short-sighted, though they may have been. I think it was that there was something elusive and suggestive and remarkable and revelatorily important about his kind of resurrection appearance. He had a body that could go through doors. He, he did things that reminded him that this was the same person, but it was the same person in a transformed state. Um, now, what I want to suggest here is that deepened belief in the resurrection, re resurrected Christ and deepened response to his presence in the world, in the sacraments, in the eyes of the poor, um, in the reading of our Bible above all, responding to the word, is a matter of training. It's an ascesis. It's, it's an undertaking of our baptism that we have to take forward with God's grace, not only by our own efforts. And this approach, of course, is, is, brings in a theory of progressive revelation, progressively unfolding providential grace, and so on and so forth. It also gets slightly um, in the way of um, something we're going to come back to next week when we discuss what the ascension is in the New Testament and how, if at all, it's different from another resurrection appearance, because especially the Gospel of Luke, um, as we see at the end of Luke and then beginning of the book of Acts, clearly wants to say that there, were these, there was this period where Jesus did appear to his disciples in various forms, and then that was over. And then comes the beginning of the period of the church when he ascends into heaven. Um, Charles Mull used to describe this as a rather strange absentee Christology. Um, he gets tidied up into heaven. And then we wait in this rather strange period uh, where between Ascension and Pentecost, 
um, for the spirit to come and the era of the church to continue. And that, plus the remark at the end of the Thomas story, blessed are those who have believed and not seen, suggests a kind of theology of non-expectation of encounters with the risen Christ in the ongoing church. But that's not the end of that story. That's what I want to suggest here. Um, indeed, if you've been a hospital chaplain or um, had anything to do with people who have claimed to met the risen Christ, uh, as I have, um, it's really quite surprising how many people do still claim to have this experience and apparently not simply under the influence of morphine. Um, and more metaphorically, to use that term in a rich sense again, the capacity to begin to see Christ more, as it were, ubiquitously in the world around us strikes me as a spiritual grace which we grow into in the life of the baptized Christian. And I think what that did to me, to end here, um, before I take a couple more questions, what that did to me autobiographically was after some years of commitment to praying silently, I found there was a kind of revolution going on inside my psyche about how my ardently rationalistic, empiricist, Lockean, critical faculties were being questioned, um, not destabilized completely, but caused to be supplemented by some response occurring into me through the action, I believe, of grace and invitation from Christ. And it caused me to start to think differently about that Humean burden of proof problem, you know, that I'm not going to believe this until the evidence is so strong, even on a kind of empirical, atheistical grounds, that I, it would be more miraculous to disbelieve it than to believe it. That struck me as the wrong way of thinking about faith now. Whereas previously I'd felt that was the only way to think about faith in a rational and modernistic fashion, unless I wanted to flip completely into the opposite, uh, either Bartian or Bookmanian position in Protestantism that got me off that Humean hook. So I'll end there today if you follow me, but I would love to take, um, a couple more questions, and then we are going to end exactly at 10.15, and I will do so with a prayer, if I may. Wonderful, so, and so we have a few more questions that have come in, um, and this, this first one relates a bit to what you were just talking about, but perhaps you could, um, it, it's just a bit different. So. Um, how do you see God's action in the belief of a given agent? Is there an, an initiating role that God plays in our belief? And how does God, who initiates or sustain us in this Paschal mystery? Yeah, this is what's so wonderful about this topic is that it brings in every single major theological question in a wonderful kind of um, um, complex. And so as one of your earlier questions asking, you know, where's your doctrine of revelation? Where's your doctrine of grace? This question is asking. Yes, is, 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 is divine grace, as it were, always on offer? And I think the answer to that is, I would say in, a, in the spirit of Augustine and many others, yes, prevenient grace is always waiting. <laughs> the invitation is always there. Or you can put it more pneumatologically, if you like, in the doctrine of the spirit. The spirit, is always inviting us into the life of Christ and the life of resurrection. Um, but, it, but there is a responsiveness that has to happen as well. Um, and that brings in the question of freedom, of course, um, and how we characterize freedom in response to God's invitation. God doesn't bludgeon us into faith, that's for sure. Um, and so it may be that there are certain things that we as modern skeptics have to be engaged in, in order to find within ourselves the capacity to respond to that which is always being invited. It's a, actually a Muslim or Muslim born friend of mine, Talal Asad, who once wrote, unbelief is a matter of untaught bodies. That's a wonderfully Muslim insight, I think. And it may be that to, to come to full and rich belief in the resurrected presence of Christ, 
one has to engage in forms of practices of attention <laughs> without which God can't fully um, uh, engage us at that deeper level, even though the offer is always there. So let me just bring up the window of my questions. So um, we've had another couple of questions come in um, and we won't be able to get to all of them, I'm afraid. Um, but that, but an alarming number at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we have taken note of them. Um, so there's a question around the role of the church in relationship to the resurrection. Um, and the questioner just wonders if you can speak to that. In a way, that's a bit of repetition of what I've just said, because, um, again, resurrection implies ecclesiology, just as it implies a doctrine of grace or a doctrine of revelation, even though not all theologians within the tradition will be, have uniform views about this. Um, but clearly, whatever the earliest um, disciples were up to, um, after they got off over the initial shock and disturbance of the appearance of Jesus, they saw their task as to go out and proclaim. Um, and indeed at the end of Matthew 28, that's precisely what they're told to do, to take it to all nations. And so it is within the cradle of the church that we learn how to believe in the resurrection in virtue of our birthright of baptism and also how to proclaim it. And how to proclaim it to a skeptical and atheistical surrounding culture, depending on where we live. America, of course, is a lot more religious than Northern Europe, if anyone's listening from there. But I think the question in every generation is, how do the, does the church do this well? And the reason I am still actually quite sympathetic to the detective story people is that I think it's not at all unreasonable that people questioning about the church want to know what our answer is to that detective story problem. And if we just say, I don't want to say a word about that, it's not relevant, come and enjoy my metaphorical existential life, um, that may convince some of them, but it may not convince others, and that would be quite reasonable if it didn't. So to move through some of the stages that I've been trying to unfold today, I think, is required, but it's a church, it's a, it's a church, apologetic necessity and we shouldn't be squeamish about it we should have our our, our approaches ready to go one last one maybe yes we have time i think just for one more um and this questioner was was sort of wondering about the relationship between um evidence which we started talking about and spiritual sensation yes and uh, they wonder if you can briefly describe the way you see the relationship between knowledge and love. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> I think we need a whole session on that one, not two minutes. But um, spiritual sensation, of course, is a very elusive notion, and I only introduced it extremely briefly. Moreover, spiritual sensation is not univocally um, understood within the Christian tradition. You might say it's a kind of minority tradition. It's been particularly of interest to, to the mystical strand within the Christian tradition. Um, and some people, notably this is often how Origen himself is understood, though I don't think it's a full picture of him, think that spiritual sensation is a kind of disembodied sensation, as if we had all five senses at a higher kind of spiritual noetic level disjunct from our physical senses. Some people read Origen that way, and I've been a bit guilty of reading him that way in the past myself, but I don't think that's right. I think towards the end of his life, Origen and certainly Gregory of Nyssa after him, saw spiritual sensation as a way of talking about how our physical body in this life begins through a kind of integration of our sensuality, our affectivity, our desires, and our mind, and this integration is a lifelong one to take, how that begins to anticipate in some form the life of the resurrection body. And I haven't said much about this, but if we go to the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives us this extraordinary announcement that we all know from the Messiah about, you know, we shall not all sleep, we shall be changed. And the question is, what does that change involve? 
Much of the Christian tradition has thought that that was all going to be only at the end times, when we all get our bodies back in some transformed state, rather like Jesus's. But there's another strand, particularly in Eastern Orthodoxy, it finds its original root in Gregory of Nyssa and goes through the Byzantine tradition, particularly in the monastic tradition, which sees our bodies as already in via, en route to the resurrection body. That's why some people glow when they're dying, if you've ever seen that. Um, so I'm talking about a whole way of thinking about our spiritual journey, which is at least as physical as noetic or psychic, and involves what um, some modern psychoanalysists like Jung would say is an integration of the parts of ourself over a lifetime. Love is perfected, but only because the body is also transformed and not, as it were, left behind. That's what I'm after here. It's a slightly minority strand. It's a, perhaps an unusual idea, but something I hope to think about. I would like to end by um, inviting you back next week, if you are able to come. Um, and remember that these sessions can also be seen afterwards. Um, Amanda works on them and sends them back to you, but you can also find them on the Ascension and St. Agnes website um, where they are left for a revisitation. Um, and next week we're going to move from in the seasonal set of reflections from resurrection to ascension, which happens to be, of course, our own patronal concern at Ascension St. Agnes. Um, and I've invited Professor William Verkohowski from um, Georgetown University, who's a leading Roman Catholic theologian, but one who was trained at Yale and therefore very well versed with the theology of Karl Barth, to um, come and talk with me in more like a dialogue next week about the theology of the Ascension, starting from the New Testament and then thinking about its implications for the tradition and for today. Um, uh, Bill is a, a theological ethicist, so we're going to think about what it means ethically to believe in the Ascension, which I think as a church we don't think about enough. I see to my alarm that there are, you know, at least 80 questions that I um, <laughs> have not properly responded to. I unwisely said I'd be very happy to hear from you on the email. If that happens, I may have a nervous breakdown, but I will do my best to respond to any urgent questions you would like to send me, even if I can't do it all immediately. And um, I'm hoping that Amanda may help me sort those out in due course. I would like to end with a prayer because in this terrible time, um, as we celebrate the life of the resurrection, we also need to remember the sick and the suffering and the dying. Let us pray. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee to you for succor. Deliver us, we beseech you, from any peril. Give strength and skill to all who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use for their cure and grant that perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts to that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Thank you.